Hi everybody, it's Katina here with The Clarinet Project. Thank you so much for coming to today's live stream. I'm happy to, to see you all, and I want to answer any clarinet questions that you have. I'm gonna go ahead and mute this. I have my computer here too, so I can actually see your questions and scroll back to them, which has been kind of a challenge in the past. Um, and if you have clarinet questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll just go ahead and look, but it's nice that some people are already here. So David Winfrey is here. Daisy Lopez is Monterosso is here. Hello. Thank you for coming. And it's your first ever live stream on my channel. Oh, and you said it was great. Thank you so much. Um, and so David and Daisy, I just want to make sure I just get everybody to say hello to. Um, but thank you so much for coming and please go ahead and post your questions. Zara is here. Nice to, nice to, Nice to see you again. Um, and then Jelly says hi also. Um, I've already had a couple questions already. So as you know, my live streams, I, do, I can't really go past 25 to 30 minutes. So I try and get to everybody's question as they arrive, but sometimes I can't get to all the questions. Wow, that really messed up my hair. Um, so one of the ones I missed before is how do I prevent a fuzzy sound, which is such a great question. I'm really happy to answer it. The first place I actually want you to check is your reed. A lot of times reeds can give you that fuzzy sound and your mouthpiece also. So if you don't have a good reed mouthpiece combo from the beginning, that can cause some problems and give you some challenges. So I just want you to double check that first. One of the ways that you can prevent a fuzzy sound from your reed is trying to go down a half strength in the reed and see if that clears up your sound. That will definitely work. You want to make sure that your mouthpiece doesn't have any chips in the tip of it, any chips or cracks in there. That can cause your sound to be funny, uh, funny and fuzzy and squeak. Also, same thing goes for your reed. If you have any chips in your reed, cracks in your reed, that's going to cause problems as well. Um, Another thing that I have noticed for me personally, if my reed has very fibrous fibers, sort of rough fibers, I can I smooth out my sound a little bit by smoothing out the reed itself. So I'll take a piece of paper and I'll put it down on a desk or something and then I will rub the reed on it on the back and then the front, smooth out those fibers and that can actually help get rid of that fuzzy sound. And for people like me that are sensitive to the reeds, so if the reeds at all rough, it'll bother my lips, especially in the winter time where um, the air is a bit drier and my lips are more chapped. So that's one way that I smooth out the reed to help with that fuzzy sound. All right, so if your reed is good and your mouthpiece is good, I need you to double check your embouchure. Make sure that you have your lip firm on the sides. Don't pull back your corners too far. It's like you're saying, ew, bring them forward, ew. You want them firm against your teeth. You can still have a little bit of a cushion right there and nice firm muscles going down into a pointed chin. This is our ideal embouchure. That will help clear up your sound as well. If you are bunching or biting the reed, that's another place where I see fuzzy sounds. So that's some, those are some of the things that you can do to help with that. Okay, all right, so let's see some other questions that we have. Um, Reese cup, which is how I'm gonna say that because there's some extra letters in there. How often should I put joint grease on my clarinet? I've had it for a year. That's a really good question. So my rule of thumb with cork grease or joint crease, a joint grease, is to put it on when you notice it's getting difficult to put your clarinet together. There's a little bit of resistance in there. If it feels a bit dry in here, it's time to put on some joint grease. I actually need to do it when I was putting my clarinet together just now. Um, it was resistant for me and I thought I really need to take some time and just put some cork grease on here. And really when I say take some time, it's probably about eight seconds of my time to put cork grease on there. In the beginning, when you have a brand new clarinet, you're gonna put the joint grease on more frequently than you normally do because you're breaking in those corks. In the winter, I also find that I do some more because the corks dry out more, but they also shrink a bit. So there's less resistance in the winter because there's not as much humidity in the air. In the summer, when there's some more humidity here, especially in Virginia, my corks expand, so it can be harder to put the clarinet on there. And then I, I need to put more cork grease on. So I just do it as needed. And those are the ways that I can tell that I need to put more joint grease on. Good question. 
hello Leanne and goodbye Leanne <laughs> Um, how often? Okay, I got that one. Tyler, hello. How often? Okay, wait, I'm getting the joint, the joint grease a lot, so I'm gonna move on. Life of Shania. I honestly can't get my A flat scale correct. Can you help? Okay, so let's talk about some traps that are in the A flat scale. We have B flat, E flat, A flat, and D flat in this scale. It took me a second to remember which ones I needed to um, put in there. All right, so you're starting down here on A flat, and then you have that lift of three fingers to the B flat, which is sort of weird. It's like you're lifting up a lot, and then you just lift up once to C, and then that D flat is right there. So the way I learn scales, and the way that I encourage students to learn scales is to talk through the scale first. Talk through the scale first with the music, especially if you're a visual learner and you need to be reading the music. So this is how I would do it. A flat, B flat, C, D flat. Do not call it a C sharp. It's gonna throw you off and you will make a mistake because you're already playing a C. So you need a D flat here. E flat on the side because of the way you're moving from D flat to the E flat. F is another big lift, open G side A flat, keep your fingers curved and close. You're gonna to drop to this C right here with your register key down in the back, D flat, E flat. So you have that exchange, C, D flat, E flat, F, G, A flat. And then you say it going back down. Once you can say it correctly, up and down with the music, it's time to take the music away, say it up and down, and then once you can say it up and down, that's time to play it. Play it with the music. Once you can play it with the music without any mistakes up and down, then take the music away and see if you, you, see if you have it memorized. If you make any mistakes, stop immediately. As soon as you miss something, stop. And that's where you need to fix it. Don't keep going. Don't go back to the beginning of the scale and try it again from the beginning. That's why when I judge competitions, the beginnings of scales are very strong. It's usually the middle and especially on the way down where people make most of the mistakes. So if you do these steps and you build a strong foundation, like you're building a foundation to a house, then you'll be able to play your A flat scale or any of your scales, especially in a high pressure situation, because that's really what we're going for here. Of course, in an ideal world, we're learning our scales so that we can sight read better, we can analyze music better, we can phrase better, and we can learn music more quickly, right? But we are graded on them and we are judged on them and they are in auditions and competitions all the time. So you have to be able to play them in a high pressure, naked situation. You're, you're not going to be as a musician playing an A flat scale for the beauty of the A flat scale. And it's a lovely scale, don't get me wrong. And if you can bring that musicality to an audition, more points for you. But we tend to get nervous, right? And we, that's when we make mistakes. And the mistakes are going to be where your weaknesses are. It always happens that way. So if you've been practicing the A flat scale and you're going along A flat, B flat, C, oh man, I missed that D flat again. Back to the beginning, A flat, B flat, C, oh man, I missed that D flat again. You've practiced missing the D flat. And I guarantee you that's what you're gonna miss in your audition unless you fix it properly. So this is what I see happen. A flat, C flat, oh, I missed D flat again. Or A flat, C, oh, I missed D flat again, right? And they'll do that like three times until they get the D flat right. And it's like, oh, I got it. I practiced it. I'm done. I got D flat once, but I got five times wrong. So what do you think is going to happen when you play that in an audition? The five times wrong that you practiced or the one time right that you practiced or you accidentally got there. So really stop and fix everything. Another thing that helps with learning scales is going slowly. I know a lot of people don't like to hear this, but it gives your mind time to think. So A flat. All right, my next note is B flat. So I'm gonna have to lift up those three fingers. And I know it feels weird, but B flat feels pretty solid. All right, now I just lift up one for C and here's the trap. What's my fingering? What's my next note? D flat. And if you think it through like that, 
and you're very intellectual about your practicing, you don't have to practice as long, your practicing is more efficient, and you will remember the scales longer and do better in your band tests and your auditions. Give yourself time to think. The part that's always amazing to me as my own playing, in my own playing and as a teacher, is that when I give myself time to think or my students take their time to think, it feels much longer on the inside. And on the outside, it's not that long at all. So when we're on the outside listening to somebody audition and things like that, I'd much rather you go slower and be accurate than fly through that scale and have wrong notes. So that's really what you want to do. You want to take your time and give that A flat the time it needs. And it might need really 15 minutes. That's all it takes, but you have to do a smart 15 minutes with it. If you're just running through the fingerings and the notes until you get it right, that's negative practicing. All right, I hope that helps. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, we've got the cork grease, cork grease. Okay, um, oh no, Reese, my clarinet got stuck together once and I was freaking out because I thought I was going to have to bring it to the music shop. Um, Lauren Saleo is here, hello, I know her. Okay, so Reese, I do wanna to talk to you about, and everybody, about when your clarinet gets stuck together. If your clarinet gets stuck together, take it to the music shop. If you have a music shop nearby, take it, because the other options I find way more terrifying. <laughs> And it's actually not that bad, but it's very scary for me. So if your clarinet gets it gets um, um, stuck together, and usually I see it in the barrel in the top joint, go ahead and get it to a music shop. They will take care of it really quickly for you. And you're supporting your local music industry if they charge you for it. A lot of times they won't even charge you for it. That's your safest bet. Okay, now here's what we can do. And you I can actually do the one I'm about to show you without the music shop first. What I want you to do is normally when we take our clarinet apart, we twist and pull, okay? But in the case of a clarinet getting stuck together, and I really wanna talk about the reasons why in a second, especially Reese, if you're feeling bad that you didn't have enough cork grease on it, because it's not necessarily related to that. One of the things you can do is rock, rock it. Rock it back and forth until it loosens up and then you twist and pull. So we can rock it. Now, ideally you're not taking your clarinet apart this way, but if it gets jammed together, that's how you wanna do it. And the reason why most of the times clarinets get stuck up here, and Reese, let me know where it got stuck. It's here or the bell. It's because your top joint can swell, especially if you have a wooden clarinet. So if you have a wooden clarinet and your clarinet gets stuck together, it's because the wood is expanding. Okay, so your top joint right here has expanded more than your barrel and it's stuck in there. And the reason why that happens is because we don't swab enough. Swab your clarinet. Every single time you're done playing it, swab it. If you are playing for a lot, like let's say you have a long rehearsal or you have a long practice session that goes beyond the 30 minutes, swab it out. If you notice water's dripping out of your belt, swab it out. If you're getting water in your keys, swab it out. So the reason why we need to swab it is because think about the wood as it's not alive per se, but it once was alive. So it's sort of, it's, it's very flexible and it, it ebbs and flows with the humidity that's around us. So if you're not swabbing it out, it can swell and it can expand and that's how it gets stopped and stuck in these joints. If you live in an area of the country that gets very humid, I used to live in South Florida, it was very humid there. I now live in Virginia, it's very humid here. That can also cause the cork and the wood up here to swell, which is how my clarinet can get stuck together. All right, there are some people that, um, <clears throat> and this makes me very nervous, and it's not something I'm comfortable doing, and I'm not going to recommend it, but you may hear it, so I wanna let you know about it, to put your clarinet in the freezer for a little bit, put a timer on for maybe five minutes, and that usually will help, and then you can pull your joints apart. The reason why I find that terrifying is I'm too scared of my clarinet cracking, and I don't want to risk it, but I do know repair technicians that will say you can do that. I've also taken orange peels and put those in my case and that helps absorb some of the moisture so that I can um, get that to un be unstuck. And then another one um, are those little silicone packets that come in, for me it's seaweed, 
you know, when you buy seaweed, like is there in there and you can toss some of those in your case and that'll help. The problem is, is when it's stuck together, you can't get it in your case. And that is kind of a problem when you're in school and you have your clarinet out. It's very scary for those of us that have, um, that clar you know, wooden clarinets or expensive clarinets, we don't want them to break. So just ask your band director if you can leave it in his office. But those are some of the things you can do if your clarinet gets stuck there. So Reese, please rest assured it's not necessarily a clarinet joint grease problem but it's actually it can be a wood problem a plastic clarinet is probably the cork grease though all right moving on um do you have any hot tips <laughs> for an absolute beginner i've been playing for a couple of days and starting lessons soon all right hannah great question all right hannah um welcome welcome to the clarinet world we are a lovely group of people pretty much in general everybody um on this youtube channel has been really great and supportive there are really good facebook groups if you're doing that with very supportive people there too every now and then you'll get some people that are a little trolly and just ignore them and carry on your merry way most of us are pretty nice all right here are my hot tips for beginner clarinetists please make sure you have good equipment if somebody can check out your equipment for you so that you have a good place to start that will help very very much you want to have a reed that works for you so start with a two and a half reed van doren daddario reeds those are great brands that you want to start with mouthpieces that come with clarinets used to be pretty terrible the stock mouthpieces weren't great for most clarinets the higher end buffet selmer yamaha clarinets have good mouthpieces now with them but if you have a um, let's say a bundy or a boucher um, a veto clarinet that came with a mouthpiece. My biggest recommendation is just to upgrade your mouthpiece to um, a Pine Polycrystal, a Phobes Debut. So there's some good beginner mouthpieces out there that aren't very expensive that you can start off with. 40, 50, 60 dollars. If you have a little bit of extra money, you can bump yourself up to one of the Van Doren or Daddario mouthpieces. The Daddario XO is good. The Van Doren, I like the Van Doren 5RV Liar. A lot of people love the Black Diamond. You can try those. And then um, Bakun's mouthpieces, the Hawkins mouthpieces, that's what I'm playing on right now. Um, they're actually really um, great mouthpieces, very competitively priced, about $120. So you do have some mouthpiece choices to bump up to. The first thing I would say for you to do is get that embouchure going. Like I talked about in the beginning. So you want your lips firm against your teeth, a little bit of cushion there, and that pointy chin. Take your barrel and your mouthpiece off together like this. Bring your mouthpiece up to your top teeth and play. It should come out as an F sharp for us. I also recommend one of these mouthpiece patches. This is a thick blank. It's one of the Diderio mouthpiece patches. It gives you a little bit more cushion for your teeth so you have more control and you don't bite for control. That's one of the big problems I see with beginners is that biting so that they can control the sound. If you find that you're clenching on the mouthpiece to get a sound that you like, try three read. That usually helps. So once again, make your embouchure, set it, bring your mouthpiece to you. Do this in a mirror or in your smartphone so that you can see what you're doing. You want to work on that embouchure. Work on it without your clarinet. The next very important thing for beginners is tonguing on the reed. So you want to use the tip of your tongue right here to right around the tip of the reed right there. <laughs> so that you're hitting that tongue on the reed. A lot of times beginners aren't taught how to tongue. It's one of those things that gets dropped and I don't understand why. And I will have students that come in and they do this ooh, 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 to articulate and it's very painful. It's hard to do and they are just powering on through and I feel so bad for them. And once they start getting the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed, really much easier to play the clarinet. A great song to start with for that is Hot Cross Buns. Because of those repeated notes in there. Another articulation trap is taking the tip of your tongue and anchoring it behind your bottom teeth and then tonguing with the middle of your tongue like that. That's called anchor tonguing. <laughs> I can't even do it. I've tried to do it and it's very difficult for me, but I'll have students that do that and it's a very heavy clunking kind of articulation. It's also very hard to control. So you want that tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. And then I would just start here. A lot of clarinet teachers and band directors have you start on open G. I find that hard to start with because you don't have any, you're not really holding the clarinet. I mean, I 
have my thumb under the thumb rest, but I find it's easier for beginners to start on an E, you get a little bit better control. And then I would walk down into the clarinet. Once you can get that G to speak without any squeaks, then play with the pinkies here and see what you can get there. So those are my hot tips for a beginner clarinet. I love, I love that hot tips, that's cracking me up. All right, very, very good question. Thank you, Hannah. All right, Reese, you are very welcome. Christina, could you show the correct embouchure? Okay, I did, but I will happily show the correct embouchure again because I don't see enough correct embouchures out there. And when I do, I get very excited. I've always said I want to have an embouchure wall of um, like a hall of fame, you know, and do like those, uh, those collage photographs of all my favorite embouchures. But so think about, um, there's many ways to think about it. So find the one that works for you. These are the ones that I have used in students, for, in, with students. All right, so for those of you that put on chapstick or lipstick, think about putting on your lipstick right there and just keeping these corners in. That'll help you get some good control for your embouchure, get that idea of how that lip feels right here. Um, for those of you that shave, I don't shave yet, but maybe one day, um, we pull your chin down. So some people think about it like that firmness of the chin for shaving. Um, I like to talk about a witch's chin. That works great, especially this time of year with Halloween coming up. Another one that has worked well is think about having a goatee and pulling it or, you know, pulling strings down like this. Ew, ew works really well also. And then this is really what it looks like. So right there. And I actually do a lot of embouchure work even for myself without my clarinet. Always do it with a mirror because then you can see what you're doing as opposed to just sort of feeling it. The one that I see a lot, they call it a strawberry chin, is that. So people pull their lip in too far. Another one I see is when we talk about the lip firm on the teeth, people pull back like this and then they have a lot of leaks. So you wanna pull forward but still have that firmness in there. I'm sure it's complicated, but once you get it, you get it, you'll know. It's like riding a bicycle. All right finish up with you because I have to stop soon. I have to, I have to start teaching clarinet lessons. Um, so any tips on how to become a professional clarinetist? Okay, I have answered similar ones to this before, but here are my biggest tips. Practice efficiently, network, meet people. And it's really easy to do with the internet right now. Meet people, you know what? Send the, um, send, front, uh, send Jose and send Corrado a message and call them Dr. You know, don't call them by their first name. Send them a message on Instagram and, and ask your question, how do I get to be a professional clarinetist like you? How do I get there? And make those connections. Say, how do I study with you? I, you know, I really admire your playing. And meet them online and see if you can get a lesson with them. It'll be amazing just to get a lesson with them anyway. And then you're tapped into that world and they know that you want to be there and stay in touch with them. Maybe go study with them in university. And that's really how you do it. A lot of classical music and jazz and professional music is networking. It's meeting people, meeting the right people and starting from there. So, you know, networking, number one, being nice and polite and kind and flexible and easy to work with, really great. Being helpful to other people, really, really important. It's more important than how you play the clarinet sometimes. I have worked with people that are the greatest clarinetists in the world. You know, they're the greatest. They play the fastest and they're wonderful players, but they were so mean and difficult to work with and I never worked with them again. I just couldn't stand it. And other people felt the same way. Whereas maybe somebody that was not quite as uh, flashy a clarinet player, they were lovely and helpful and kind and flexible and really easy to work with. And of course I hired them again or I worked with them again or they were hired by other people. So that's, you know, that's really, really important. And then that practicing and working really hard and being innovative, working with other composers, um, premiering works, things like that to make you a, a little bit different than just playing the Debussy Rhapsody over and over again. Try something new, um, find a niche, find something that you're really good at that's unusual in the clarinet world, that also helps too. All right, everybody, I'm gonna wrap up so I can go to my next clarinet appointment. Thank you everybody for coming and I will see you next week. Bye. I'm trying to log off. I can do it. <laughs>